You are welcome to this preview of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 from the New English Translation of the Bible. This passage is especially important for it explains how repentant Christians from diverse racial, political, cultural, and theological backgrounds can dwell together in peace. We offer a working outline of the epistle in nine points. Still in section four on teaching for edification. The structure of the passage is simple. It begins with an imperative, remember, you were Gentiles without God, followed by an affirmation, but now you are near God, with two explanations, the first of which, for he, Christ, is our peace, having made the two races one, with a dual purpose to make one new humanity and to reconcile both by his cross. The second explanation, he announced peace. For what cause? We both access the Father in one spirit. With this result, therefore you are fellow citizens, God's family, built upon the apostles and prophets, growing in the Lord, and being united in the Spirit. By way of background, if you are in a mixed group, have someone read aloud Acts 21, verse 28. Then explain that Paul may have penned this epistle to the Ephesians from prison in Caesarea, following his arrest in Jerusalem, charged with desecration of the temple. Have someone read aloud verse 11. Always allow participants to share their views, observations, information, and queries they would like to discuss before you present your own. Then you may ask, why say in the flesh? Noting that these Gentiles were now in Christ. Then discuss, why say performed by human hands. Well, this phrase is used only once in the entire Greek First Testament of idols made by human hands. Furthermore, there is a circumcision of the heart. So, what are we to remember? Have someone read aloud verse 12. Pose this query. What are five advantages of being born a Jew? Find them in this verse. Note that the term atheist could mean either to be without a God or to deny the gods to be an atheist. In the first century CE, polytheists and Christians accused each other of atheism. The charge was especially volatile since the security of the state depended on proper relationships with there the gods. At, there are at least eight covenants mentioned in the First Testament that carry a promise. The Noahic covenant promised there will never again be a worldwide flood. The Abrahamic covenant promised a posterity and a land for the Hebrews and blessing for the Gentiles. The Mosaic Covenant promised national prosperity and security predicated upon obedience to God's law. The Sinaitic Covenant provided for personal and family prosperity. The Davidic Covenant foretold an everlasting kingship of those descended from King David. The Isaianic Covenant spoke of a national redeemer and a prophetic spirit yet to come. Then there was the everlasting covenant, which would bring peace, national multiplication, and general knowledge of Yahweh. And then the new covenant promised forgiveness of sins, reunification of Israel and Judah, 
and the gift of God's Spirit to believers. Have someone read aloud verse 13, the affirmation. Discuss which Gentiles are now nearer than before, all of them, or only those who are now Christian? Are they now only near, or have they come all the way? Why say, by the blood of Christ, and not just by Christ? And how does this allude to the first covenant sacrificial system? As the first explanation, he is our peace, have someone read aloud verses 14 and 15, and discuss what kind of peace, what does it look like? Both what groups, resulting in one what? What does it mean to nullify, destroy, cancel, abrogate the Torah? or that it is no longer applicable to the forgiven? And how does flesh relate to blood in verse 13? To explain the dividing wall, you may read these passages from Josephus' War of the Jews. Have someone read aloud verse 193 and then verse 194. In 1871, there was discovered this stone, which used to be located at the temple on a dividing wall separating Gentiles from Jews, ensuring that no Gentile would enter the temple proper. Written in Greek, it warned, No stranger is to enter within the balustrade round the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. This is somewhat inconsistent with First Testament views on Gentiles. Have someone read aloud, for example, 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43, and Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. The purposes for what Christ has accomplished read verses 15 and 16. Note that the term new, kainos, in some manuscripts has common, koinos, with only one letter difference. Both words make good sense in the context. Consider or discuss together what body is this talking about or whose body? And what does it mean to Kill the hostility. Why not say, remove the hostility? The second explanation, he announced peace, reading verses 17 and 18. When and where did Jesus preach peace to those who were far off? And when did he preach to those who were near? Discuss what does it mean to access the Father in one spirit. And why say spirit and not one Messiah? Well, Jesus did preach peace to those who were near. Read, for examples, John 14, 27 and John 20, 21. Did Jesus preach peace to those who were far? Or was Paul mistaken? Well, the Septuagint reads, Peace upon peace to those that are far and to those that are near. Paul seems to be paraphrasing that verse from the Greek Septuagint version of the First Testament, whereas the Hebrew Masoretic text reads, Peace, peace to the far and to the near, using collective singular forms. The answer may be found in Greek grammar, for the Greek dative noun case without a preposition may mean two or four in a given context. That is, Jesus preached for those who were near, and he preached for those who were far. The result of this, then, is found in verses 19 and 20. Note the metaphors, citizens, 
household, foundation, cornerstone, what is their common meaning? Think about a dwelling place for God and for the redeemed. And what saints are these? Saints in heaven, Christian saints, or Israel as the chosen holy people of God? Note the grammar of the phrase, the apostles and prophets. This implies that the apostles and prophets here constitute one group, probably all of them in the early church. Thus, we must ask, are these first or New Testament prophets? Is Jesus the cornerstone or the capstone? The only place where cornerstone is used in the Greek Septuagint is Isaiah 28.16, and there it clearly refers to a cornerstone that is part of a foundation. The apostles and prophets, then, because the prophets appear after the mention of the apostles and because they are linked together in 3.5 as recipients of revelation about the church, they are both to be regarded not as Old Testament prophets, but as New Testament prophets. Read aloud verses 21 and 22. Note again the metaphors, building, joined, temple, built, dwelling. What is their common meaning? And then explain in the Lord and in the Spirit. How do these relate to each other? Think of the living God who both builds a temple and dwells within it. By way of summary, we find three groups of seven phrases in this passage that may be presented in sequence. Gentiles in the flesh, citizens of Israel, covenants of promise, circumcision, hope and God in the world, a law of decrees are resulting in hostility. But then reconciliation. Messiah came in flesh, gave his blood of the cross, nullifying the law of decrees. The partition is now destroyed, the hostility killed, one new humanity in Christ reconciled to God. And thirdly, the resulting peace. The two groups become one. Peace is announced. We have access to the Father in one spirit. We are fellow citizens, God's household, a holy temple. As a final point of discussion, ask what is one truth, insight, belief, or action that you learned from Ephesians chapter 2 this week? For next time, let us read a chapter of Ephesians each day in versions that you trust, and then let us study Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, preparing comments and queries for discussion.